Hi guys and welcome back to the channel. This is the in-depth look at how to build this frame legend brace door or side gates as I called it that we featured a couple of months back with the quick run through video. So this is the gate that I'm going to be building in SketchUp here. It's got a 3x4 frame so that's a 70 by 95 mil finish frame and I've got to extend one of them jams into the ground so it can be a, a fixing point because this fence hasn't got much strength to it there's no posts or anything nearby so i'm going to extend that jar into the ground and concrete it in and i can fix the top from side to side sway onto the fence here and then the top of the frame will carry some strength through to hold the frame in place got a nice little detail on the head here that will throw the water off so we've made a, a simple joint out of this section by splitting that head in two. So we've got a capping piece, and a nice simple square, but or mortise and tenon joint in the top of them jams there. The door itself is divided up so all the panels are equal. So the boarding is exactly the same size as the styles. I like to do this because it, it just looks nicer. It's much nicer than seeing a wide door style, then a narrow board, then other size boards in the middle, then another narrow board and a, a wide style again. It just, just doesn't look uh, bespoke made. The, the more even you can get them panels, the better, in my opinion. So I like to divide them across the width of the door and make them all equal. You have to be a little bit careful with that if you're using my method of fixing the boards because you lose quite a bit when you machine one of the boards in the end here because there's a tongue on one side and a tongue on the other side of the board so you're losing about 7 mil each time with them two machining so whatever finish width you want your board this is 120 mil you're going to have to allow for that 7 mil either side as well as the physically planing it up to get it straight so you're going to be about 20 mil bigger uh, rough sawn size than your finished board size on this particular board here so just be careful that you can actually get that board out of the timber that you've got moving around to the back of the door this is the frame legend brace so the frame legend brace part of this project is the physical door itself so the frame that it hangs within is nothing to do with the frame legend brace door it's just the door so the reason it's called a frame legend brace door it has this framing section around the outside that provides it its strength and that's made up of the door styles and the top rail and then the ledges are so called as they are the middle rail and bottom rail so the ledges in the door and then obviously the braces is the diagonal sections that brace the door from stopping it from dropping over time so the dimensions of the door from the back here, our style width is decided for us on the uh, dividing of the boarding equally. I keep the head of the door the same width as the style. So they're always the same and run through around the door. I've found this to look the best over time. I always do my braces slightly narrower than the styles. It just looks a just looks a bit too chunky and a bit weird if they're the same width as the styles but it's, it's not the end of the world if they are I've just found it it's slightly more finesse if they're slightly thinner and then middle rail and bottom rail I like them to be a decent size I, I feel that you get a much stronger door if they're a nice nice chunky size so in this case for a standard height door I've used 9 inch middle rail and a 9 inch bottom rail so that's 225 mil finish quickly show you some dimensions and then we'll jump into the workshop so you can screenshot these if you're going to follow this door pretty pretty accurately so we're 976 wide and we've got 2.1 meters to the top of the frame and you can grab some other dimensions off there if you need to so we've got a 70 mil frame section with a 20 20 mil plant on stop i would use a plant on stop on an external gate just just purely for the factor of if it gets damaged with putting stuff through it like wheelbarrows and stuff like that you can replace it and also the fact because it's outside and you do suffer any movement or the fence panel that it's attached to moves then you've got the ability to remove the stop put it in a new position and have a, a working door again fairly simply 
So that's the dimensions on the face. The only other detail really that's anything significant is on the head of the frame. And we've got this section here. So we're just going to make a square section that joins to the jams. And then we've got a, a plant on piece or a weather capping that will form this top section here. And that's 38 mil by 125 that features the two capillary grooves to stop the rainwater running on top of the head and on top of the door. Right, we're in the workshop now. So we're going to get to work setting these pieces of timber out. I've planed everything up and cut it to rough length plus about 20 mil on all the pieces of timber as per the drawing we've just done. So I've got my plan here from the computer. Now this is the head of the frame. So this is the half thickness. So it's the part we're going to join to the jams of the frame itself. And then there's going to be a capping piece that sits on top of this that's going to shed the rain off. So I'm going to make that up in two parts. So this is the part we're interested in now that we're going to put the joint in to join it to the jams. Let's grab a tape measure. We're going to mark on the external width to the outsides of the frame. So that's 976. Square that line over. Come in the thickness of the jams, which is 70 mil on both sides. And I'm going to put a setback in, but an unusual setback in this case, because we're going to set back from the outside of the frame. So like we saw in the drawing, I don't want to see the tenon on the outside of the frame. So I just want to see a square joint between them two pieces. So in order to do that, we've just got to set back on this tenon and cut it away once it's been formed. So I'm just going to come in about 12 mil on that. Put a set back there. So we're not going to mortise that part. We're only mortising this wider section. You can of course domino this part and it would probably be as strong or stronger but in order to keep this a traditional and sort of simpler technique for if you've not got a domino I'm going to do it with a mortise and tenon but I would recommend putting a domino in either side somewhere about there and there and then four screws or six screws one two three four five six all pilot hold and properly counterboard so that there's no tension in that timber as you drill them in and that head of that frame will be really nicely stitched to them jams but we can get get away with it well it, it's going to be as good with a proper mortise and tenon but like i say the domino would be dead quick and takes about five minutes but the mortise and tenon method will work with a bigger frame so if this was a full thickness 70 mil head and you put the tenon right through it in a traditional door frame then you'd be a lot stronger in your joint then than just using a, a domino that's only 25 mil deep. Plus, unless you make your own dominoes, you're limited to either hardwood or beach dominoes, and a coir is a lot more durable than that. So we'll set up a mortise. Yeah, we'll put the mortise in the middle. Set up the gauge, to the mortise, Take it off, stab that in. And if you want to do central, you work from both sides. So you start with a rough measurement, then you can adjust to suit the mark from both sides until you end up with something that is very close to being in the middle. There we go. Always mark from the face, even if the joint's in the middle of the, the piece of timber. You always want the face mark and always work from that one face. Traditionally, that would have been because you're hand planing things to thickness. Everything's not going to be perfect. So if you work from a face, you know you've got one face absolutely right. And then if there's a variation in timber thickness, it's not going to make too much of an effect. So that's our set out for the head. We'll do the same thing for the jams and the joint on that. So I'll send this tenon all the way through this piece of timber. So we'll mark the equivalent thickness on the head of this joint and square that over. We've got our face and an edge mark and then use that gauge to mark our joint positions. Now I can cut this out by hand or I'm going to use the tenoner. So we're just cutting them two 
shoulders nice and square in line with each other because we're using a adjustable or a plant on stock there's no need to have any setback for rebates or anything so this is a really simple frame with just a simple straight mortise and tenon in it so let's cut them tenon cheeks and then we'll mortise the head in the mortiser Just notch the edge of this tenon off to the same setback that we put on the mortise. I'm just going to give it a try run or a dry fit. That's a pretty good fitting joint. So I'm going to take it back apart, put some 5 by 70 mil screws and then glue this joint back together after I've sanded all the inside edges and put a round over on all the joint components. Before I glued this together, I've been a bit sneaky and chopped the hinges in on the hinge side of the frame. It's much easier to do that with the jam in the vise on its own than it is when you've got a complete frame assembled. I've got some fairly long fixings to go in here. I'd rather use a long fixing and quite a large, it's not a pilot bit, of, it probably is a pilot bit. So you're getting the pull strength of the fixing over a longer distance with less sideways pressure. So if you to put a 5 for 50 in there without a pilot hole, it'd probably pull it in as much as using a, I don't know, a five by 80 like this and having a four mil pilot hole in a five mil screw. So the only difference is if you're using four mil pilot hole with a five mil screw, you're not putting any or very little sideways pressure on this piece of timber and it's make it much less prone to splitting in the future. So if any stresses act on the screws or the fixings, because you've already taken that stress out of it by giving it a pilot drill, it's not gonna split at that point. Whereas a screw fixing that's not been pilot drilled at all, if you whacked a, a 70 or an 80 mil screw straight into that piece of timber there, it'd probably take it, but it's more likely to snap the screw and it's more likely to split that piece of timber, especially in time and especially if you're not using a coir. So if you're using a timber that can move with these seasonal movements, then you're more likely to see a split appear in that jam. Countersink then. These are quite good countersink bits. They're about six, seven quid for a pack of four off of eBay. I think they're actually called deburring cutters. But the big ones are quite useful for sinking in like countersink concrete screws and that type of thing. There we go, got a nice little fix in there. There's no pressure, or not too much pressure in any direction. As we can, check the diagonals on this one. We're just going to do the best we can with a framing square. Just make sure that everything is nice and square. Looks like it wants open up a touch. Yeah, it's bonny. Just nip them fixings again. So now we're getting into the juicy bit of the video. Uh, probably what most people have come here for and that's the door construction. 
This style of door is called a frame, ledge and brace door. So the joints we're going to use is a mortise and tenon, so wedged mortise and tenon and it's going to have proper styles and proper rails. Don't get this confused with a ledge and brace door or a ledge and brace gate where the construction of the gate or door is based on the thickness of the boards held together by the rails nailed to the back of it. This is a, a proper structural door that has a, an outer frame, so the framed part is the name, and then the ledges are the rails that connect the two, and obviously the braces are what brace it, stop it from sagging over time. So this is the, the better style of door and the more expensive option for a uh, gate or a door within your house. So as always, Let's have a look at the timber we've got out, have a good look over it, make sure there's no imperfections and if we have got any we'll try and hide them within the door somewhere where it's less likely to be seen or not going to be seen at all. I ran you through the manufacturing method that I used for this door at the start of the video in the SketchUp drawing, so we use a groove in the side of the style that the boarding will sit into and we've worked all them widths out from that drawing. In terms of face mark positioning, I think I mentioned it in the video, but I use the back of the door as the face mark, so the side of the door that has the braces on it, that's the face for when I'm machining this door. The reason for that is the rails that are behind the boarding, so they're less in thickness. If you use the face as the front of the door, you'd have to pack them rails on the tenoner as you push them through to keep them at the desired height in the tenoner, or make an adjustment and move the machine. Whereas if you work from that back side where the braces are, everything is referenced from that face and can be machined all at the same time. So you just bear that in mind when you're setting out. If the front of the door that you see from the outside is your critical side and you've got a, a piece of timber that's not quite as nice on one side to the other, it's the non-face side that you want to be the better face of the timber. So like this piece here, with a lovely clean face where it's planed it with a bit more depth and exposed the nice sort of clean wood. On the other side, we've got a little bit of patching where the stickers have been during the treatment process for the Akoya. So we don't want this showing on the outside of the property. We'll put that towards the inside. So we'll make this edge the face. We'll just check the edges, make sure there's no uh, little splits or anything where that groove's gonna go, because we want that nice and strong. And we sh should be okay with that bit in this orientation. So once we've got our two faces, we always put them so that they point to each other. We're going to mark out on this uh, this edge surface here. So just grab some clamps and clamp them together. I'm going to start with marking the extremities of the door styles on. So in this case, it's the door height, and we've got a door height of 2016, 2017. So we've got a three mil gap at the top, and we just allowed an initial 10 mil gap underneath from the 2 meters 30 that is on the inside of the frame. So let's mark 2017 as our frame height. We've got about 70 mil. So if we would mark off the 30, and add that on at the other end. 47. And just double check that off the end of the tape like always. 2017. 2017, perfect. I've made this frame in mind with the sort of standard door height underneath the uh, door stop there. So we know we're gonna have a decent clearance of any internal doors through this side gate. If we make this end the bottom, we just mark our, the width of our rails in from them two end marks. So the bottom rail we've got is 220 mil. That can be whatever. I, I won't go much less than six inches for uh, bottom and middle rails, but it's not going to make too much difference to the strength of the door. If you've got a decent tenon in there as to uh, what size you use. Top rail we worked out from the drawing, so we can mark that on the top, in from that mark. 
and then the middle rail. If we mark it on from either the top or the bottom at that point, and then just measure the, the gap that's left. So we've got 14.55 allowing for the 100 mil. And then we divide that by two. Once we've got that figure, we work from the inside of them two rails. So the bottom rail, the top side of the bottom rail, we measure on that figure that we've just divided by two. 727.5. And the same down from the top rail, so the bottom side of the top rail. Working from 100 mil, got to add that on again. That should leave us with our rail of 120 mil, or 220, sorry. We can then square them two lines over, and that gives us the position of our three rails within the door. Now, because this is a gate, I'm going to bevel the tops of these rails so that it throws any water that may land on them away from the door. Now in order to do that, because we've got a mortise in there, if we mortise right up to this line, which is the external of the timber, and then beveled it away, we'd have a little gap in the top of that joint. So I just do a little setback on the top side of these rails. And it's got to be at least five mil if the mortise is to be hidden, but go a little bit more if you want to. But I normally work with a five mil set back from the top of the rail. So that needs to happen on the middle rail and also the bottom rail as well. So you can see it, so five mil, and we'll just square them lines over. So that's now the edge of our joint. That inside line there is where our joint will come up to. So we can divide the bottom rail into our wedged mortise and tenon, so we've got the through mortise and then the haunt rooms. So we're going to have a double mortise through here because it's too big to have a single mortise go through the door. So I usually like to have a bit extra at the bottom of the door and then two smaller tenons towards the top of the joint. So on a 220mm rail I'll look at using a 50mm tenon through the door and then a little bit more for a haunt room in between. So if we go 55 and then another 50 mil tenon, and then that leaves us with a little bit extra at the bottom. So we've got 60 mil left at the bottom. The reason for that is if we ever trim anything off the door or, you know, you, your strength of the door in the bottom of that joint, if you're wedging against this piece of timber that's left, if that's too narrow and then you take say 10 mil off the bottom of the gate to let it in in the future you want to it's not clearing certain stones or something on the floor if you cut anything off there and you're too close to the bottom anyway that joint's going to lose all of its strength so always leave a decent amount of timber behind that uh, wedge room on the bottom and top of the sash so that's what i'm going to use for a 220 mil rail 50 mil tenons 55 mil between them and it leaves you with 60 mil at the bottom when you've got that 5 mil setback for the belt. So the order of that joint there is mortise here, haunch there, mortise and then a haunch. We need to square these two mortises over to the other side of that piece of timber so that we can machine it from both sides rail of the door, we don't need to do a setback, you can if you'd like to, because there is a small risk with any timber when you're mortising that the mortise should all could chip or not do an absolutely perfect cut on this inside line. So you could do a tiny setback if you wanted to be absolutely certain of having a, a dead crisp edge along the inside there. I've never bothered with that. I've always managed to get on quite well without doing that. So I'm just going to 
leave the mortise right up to the inside edge of that piece of timber and then make the through tenon just under half of the piece of timber. So I'm going to be around 55mm for this uh, tenon in the top of the door. I'm going to mark that on. I've just got a single tenon and then the haunch room behind it. So we need to square this mortise through and over to the other side. And then the middle rail, which is the same principle, but instead of like the bottom rail, we've got not got offset tenons, we're going to have a, a mortise and tenon either side of the joint. So it's going to be two tenons and a haunch in the middle. So it's separated up slightly different from the bottom joint. So we've got that 5mm set back for the bevel on the rail there. Then we're dividing it by three this time, but we want to add about 10mm to the centre section. So if we lose 10mm off of this measurement, if we look at it being 200mm, uh, and we divide that by three, roughly we're going to be talking about 65mm. So if we do a 65mm tenon, keep things nice and simple, 65 leaves us with 85 in the middle. So if we knock that down two and a half mil each way, leaves us with 80 in the middle. That should be about right. Let's do 67 and a half. Once we've marked the three rails on, we can square their mortises over. We'll start with the middle rail here. And we're just, just squaring over the mortises. So at the top and bottom of the door, we don't need to worry about squaring over the height of the door. And on the back side of the door, again, carry them lines over. And on a door like this, I would recommend allowing about 8mm for a wedge room. Something like that. And the wedge room is showing on a, on a setting out by a line that doesn't cross right through the door so you know exactly what it's for. Do that for all three rails on each door style. Hopefully you can see what's going on. So we're ignoring this line here, which is the height of the door. And just squaring across those mortise lines. So that back edge. And then a wedge room alongside it. Et voila. Same for the top. Something like that. If you want to be really get your wedges really even in this side of the door, you want to have a slightly bigger wedge room on the inside, so where there is a really tight joint between the rail and the cut on the mortise. And on the outside here, you have a tiny bit of wiggle room when you cut the actual tenons down to fit in the door. So you might allow one mil of wiggle room so you can physically get the door together. So you make this wedge room slightly less than that inside, but it's not too essential. That's a bit perverse. If we do the same for the other door style, that's the door set out ready to mortise. The rails for the door, bottom, middle and top, I'm going to square one end up on the cross cut and then cut them to the full width of the door, so the full width of the opening.
Right, so we're going to tenon amp first and mortise second. So we need to set out the tenon position. I'm just going to mark on this, this is a pattern piece. You always want to get a pattern piece out when you're tenoning a door or anything for the first time. If you've not set up, you're going to need something to set up from. So I'm just going to mark the length on here that the tenon needs to be and tick that across. I generally mark this on quite roughly, I mean as accurately as you can, which is nice, but I'll check the tenon length with a vernier caliper from the square cut off the end there, so it's, it's more of a guide for the setup process. Now I use the twin head tenoner and I cut the tenon so that there's a nice square joint between the shoulders, so where the square of the door style meets the two cuts on the shoulders, it's perfectly in line. So I've got no setback for a rebate for the boards to sit in. But the position of that tenon widthwise within the door is partially dictated by the thickness of the middle rails. So these are called a bare-faced rail. You might come across that in their joinery terms. And what that means, traditionally, a bare-faced tenon would have exactly that. One face would be perfectly smooth and in line with the face of the timber. So it saves you cutting a tenon on this side of that rail, traditionally. So you'd only need to cut a tenon along there and form a shoulder on one side, and that's a bare-faced rail. So one side is already done for you, nice and flat, dead easy to cut. The only downside to that, I find, is there's no shoulder on this side of it to help butt up against. So you can tend to find, if you're not careful, the styles when you're clamping can slightly dip into this side of the timber, and it also leaves you you're at the hands of the accuracy of your machinery. So this bottom cutter block has got to be perfectly in line with this face here to form that thickness of tenon that you require. It can be a bit of a pain to set up. So what I normally do is, especially on the thicker doors, if you're doing a two and a quarter thick door, is have the tenon so that it cuts a small cheek on this side as well, so that you've got a, a tiny little shoulder there for it to work to. And the other bonus of that is glue from this joint when you push it in together to make the final glue up. It doesn't push all that glue off and seat it within the groove where the boards go and that can be a bit of a git to clean out. The edge of the piece of timber on the door will actually push it out to somewhere where it's accessible to clean off which is a, a small advantage as well. So I set up, this, is, this dictates our absolute maximum height of the tenon away from the face. So if we just tick that onto this piece of timber, just there. And then if we mark the thickness of our rail on there. Tell you what, I'm gonna do it as a bare face tenon, because that's how you would do it if you were making it traditionally. So we're gonna mark that point there and that point there. So that is the position of our tenon, dictated by the thickness of this rail off of the back edge of the door. So the side that we've designated as the face. So this is the face of our pattern piece. So we're working from this edge on the bed of the tenoner and we're cutting our tenon in a position where the top of that tenon meets this piece of timber. So we'll stick that on the machine and set it up to them settings. I'm just going to screw this backing piece on so that as the cutter cuts through the piece of timber it prevents it from breaking out. So you want to find the spur cutter on the block because that's the, if you set your, your knives correctly, your spur cutter is the part that will actually form the edge that is the tenon. So that's the most extreme part in terms of the height of the cutters within the cutter block. So I just put the spur cutters next to the lines that we need to match up to and just move the cutters until they come in line with that. And give it a test run. When you do your very first cut and you're cutting that the backing piece that you screw to the fence, you want to make sure that the cutters are back from where you potentially might need them. They don't want to be forward and then have to move them back to a cut 
So you're gonna have to reposition this to make sure that the cut is exactly in line with this piece of timber. If you don't reposition it and you've cut forward and then moved the cutter block back from that position, you end up with a small portion of timber on each piece that you cut that's not supported by this backing piece and will make it a rougher cut so you'll get more breakout at that point. So always make sure that if you're aligning two cutter blocks, especially on the Sedgwick, the top head is slightly back before you do your first cut and you move it forward into position. So there we go, we can check the squareness of that joint against these shoulders from either side of the tenon there. So we want that to be as accurate as possible, so deadly accurate there. We want to check the height from the face to this side of the tenon is exactly the same as the thickness of these rails. I've gone about, it's about a quarter of a millimetre lower, so I definitely know I'm going to cut just a tiny, tiny cheek off the top of this rail, so I know my tenon will be a good fit. So that's perfect, and we just want to check the thickness of the tenon too, against the thickness of the mortise chisel. So the tenon thickness here, I've got 15 point seven mil my mortise chisel measures 15.8 mil so that's probably just a tiny bit tight for a, a wide joint like that where you've got a lot of surface area you probably want to be 0.2 of a mil under the thickness of your mortise chisel at, at its solid section so if you measure your chisel mine's 15.8 you probably want a joint of tenon thickness on a vernier caliper of 15.6 mil at that point there but if you are a touch tight it's not the end of the world to take a really sharp plane and just skim it a touch off each joint but it's a lot better than being on the loose side so we'll push them all through the tenon and now when we get to the middle rails and the bottom rails we're just going to have to use a packing piece the same thickness as the boarding we're using so that the tenon clamp will push it down. Now that they're tenoned, we can move on to mortising the styles. I've just got to raise my mortise chisel up here so I can fit the rail underneath it. So we use the big spanner with the Sedgwick. You undo this nut on the back here and it moves the carriage that holds the, the physical motor on the actual carriage that slides up and down. So you've got adjustment on that carriage of that height there and that's the part that moves up and down. You've got to hold the weight of the motor while you undo that nut, lift it up enough to where it's sensible so you've got enough clearance and then tighten that nut back up again. We've already got a 16mm chisel in so we can set the tenon position. So we're using the face as a reference on the fence. So we'll sit that side against the fence and clamp it in position. Gonna have to move the clamp too. The old Multico machines used to have a toggle clamp. So you'd have a T-slot in the bed and a cam action clamp. It's dead quick for changing material thicknesses, which is quite nice. So you'd have a slot in here, undo the clamp, push it to where you wanted it, and do it up again. And that held the 
clamped in place, whereas this system is a bit slower and a bit more limited in what positions you can use it in. It's actually annoyingly located just between 95mm and 56mm, which is sort of your common sizes for normal joinery. So your doors will be 56, 58 mil thick and your frame's 95 mil thick and you have to move it between the two, which is quite annoying. So clump that in there. We'll just set the position of the mortise chisel on the Sedgwick machine. You pull this handle outwards and it engages in the cog that adjusts the forwards and back position. So it's one handle that does both movements. It's quite low geared, which is nice. You can get a really accurate tenon position. This way, you're pretty much guaranteed to get a nice flush joint or as close to it as you're gonna possibly get if you do your mortising first. It's a bit more hit and miss between getting the position of the joint exactly right and getting the right thickness tenon, unless you spend a fair bit more time on the tenon there, adjusting those blocks to get the positions right. This is a much quicker system. Slight variation between them two. Let's turn it over, pick a middle ground. That should give us a nice flush joint. That wants to go that way. This one is about right. Just there. So the top rail is the same height as the styles, so we can use the top rail to set up the depth of our chisel. Just mark the halfway position on there so we can see it for a reference. Our wedges only really need to be about 70 mil long at maximum, so somewhere around here will be the wedge room or wedge height from this from this back edge. So if we set our haunch up first, which you have to do on this machine because of the arrangement of the height locking mechanism here, a haunch could be quite deep into the door, especially because we've not got a rebate taking any material from the sides of the door. We can get a really nice deep haunch, and that's loads of glue surface area within that joint. So I'm going to opt for somewhere around there, it looks about 45mm and tighten that clamp off really nice and tightly. Then we need to adjust the other grub screw part so that it clears halfway through the piece of timber. If we undo that one, so that's a halfway mark and that mushroom on the chisel there needs to go at least beyond that point. So if we go to there, it's nice and comfortable on the handle, it's not too deep. And again, we've got to tighten that up nice and tightly so it uh, grips onto that rod. This one's a little bit more tricky to tighten up tightly because it is a tiny little allen key but if you're careful you can get enough pressure on there to hold on to that rod. And that's the depth settings of the mortiser done, the width position done and we can jump straight into mortising. So if you watch the window series you'll know it's face against the fence and we start from the back edge so the side with the wedge room on it. We're not starting from that inside edge I've explained all of that within the casement window series that I did quite recently. I think I called it oak casement window. And then we're just mortising these lines. As you slide a piece of timber along, you want to make sure that no timber or wood chips fall down the back against the fence and move the position of this mortise, because that'll be where any inaccuracy comes and steps in your, your shoulders and your joints.
moving that all the way through because the camera's in the way to hold the piece of timber. Remember we're going in on these edges first, so where the rails are being wedged up to the inside edge there, which is our reference point, the mortise chisel wants to enter that point first, so there's no deflection. If you cut the mortise away and then do that cut last, your mortise chisel, due to the resistance in the timber, will tend to bend away and it won't mortise up tight to this line. Now before we cut the joints for the haunch room or wedge room and the haunches on these tenons we need to make or get rid of that 5mm setback that we allowed when we were setting out so that when we do the bevel on the top of these rails it's not going to leave a gap. So we need to just square this shoulder over on the top of the rail and we're going to cut down at that line there 5mm in depth as a stop cut on the tenon there so that when we machine this back if anything starts to split or splinter as we machine it it's not going to carry on into this rail and be visible. So I'm just going to cut this back with a rough old tenon saw. Roughly 5mm. Do that on both sides machine the edge and then just square that up with a nice sharp chisel. Then we need to prep the bottom of the haunch room. So we're going to take these wisps of timber that are left by the mortiser from the edges of that mortise haunch room. And just cut down the edges to the depth of the haunch. And you can either use the appropriately sized chisel in the mortise, a slightly smaller one, and run it along that haunch height, like so. Or when you Chiseling from the side with this, you can just work it in like that. It doesn't need to be a particularly clean cut, you're just making a clearance for that tenon to sit against the haunch. So now everything's prepped, we can cut the wedge room out, or the haunch area room, from the rails. We're working from the face, making sure the two faces are aligned and that edge mark is in the appropriate position, so pointing into the door. That's where we're going to machine a groove. We put the mortise in position, push it up nice and tight to that inside line, and we're going to tick the three mortise position. I usually tick an allowance in the mortise position, so I'll tick just one side of it by about half a millimetre, and that gives us a little bit of wiggle room so that when you're assembling and disassembling the door, you've got a tiny bit of room to make it happen. If you cut it too tight and it pinches, they can be a right git to get apart and put back together. You end up having to cramp or hammer the door apart and you end up damaging it. So it's a tiny bit of wiggle room in that plane is perfectly fine because you've got the wedges behind it to take it up eventually when you glue it up. So we do that for both pieces. 
marking the face on both sides or the back face, it doesn't matter which side you mark. And then you'll end up with a tick line on your actual tenon, just here. I'm going to set up a combination square to check the depth of the haunch room. Loosen off the rule, and push it down to the haunch room. And just run it over it, make sure you've got the high spot. So just keep checking it's pushed down and run it across the whole joint and then lock it off. And then we can just run that back over and check that that is touching all the way across and check the other joints too, make sure that all of that bottom of that horn trim is clear. So you see we've got a half mil discrepancy there, so I'm just going to raise that up a touch, make sure it clears. You can either chisel that out deeper or just raise that ruler up to accommodate. If you're within half a mil on this setting, that's fine. If you want a really, really sharp haunch joint, so everything's nice and square, you're going to have to remove the tails from the mortise a bit, so the, the drill bit leaves a point and a circle cut into the timber. If you want that perfectly square when you look from the top of the door, you're going to have to hand chisel that out or router that out. So you're not going to get a perfect fit without doing that anyway. So having a, a half mil gap is nothing in the end of the joint in that position. I'll just check all the others. It's good to check probably the one that you mortise first and the one that you mortise last to make sure that the mortiser didn't move while you were using it. Now we've got that measurement there. From the end of the rule to the mark where it reads the square is the length of our haunch. So on here that's 44 and a half millimetres. So if we go to the rail now, so that's our tenon, and this is our haunch. We want 44 and a half millimetres from this point here. So we have to open the square up, mark the 44 and a half, and then I use the combination square again from the end of the tenon and make sure that my pencil line makes a mark on that line. So I'm not going, I'm not setting the end of the square dead on the line, because then the pencil marks another half a mil further. I'm making sure that the pencil line actually makes the same mark as that four to four and a half. And then this square is then set, and we can do it on all our tenons the same. We can square down that line. That's our cut for the tenon. Then we can use the end of the ruler as the guideline for the horn tree. So we're going to cut down there and cut down there and that gives us our tenon formation. It's the same on the other end, tenon this side. So once you've set that square, it's dead quick to make these marks. There we go, cut, cut, and that leaves us our nice tenon. It's the same principle on the bottom rail. Cut in that rail. Tiny bit tight. So we're marking the tenons, which is this one and this one, and the haunches there and there. So on the tenons, we're just coming slightly inside of the line. Now, because that's tight up against here, this one can be tight up against there. And then on the other side, we just want that tiny bit of wiggle room. So about half a mil to a millimeter inside of that line to make the tenon smaller than the mortise. And from them three tick lines, we can go back to our combi square and set the joint out. So this is a tenon, that's a tenon, that's a haunch, that's a haunch. So square the tenons down. And mark the haunches. Now if you're setting these out, oh, you normally just put a squiggle line on there just to engage your brain that you're cutting that part out and you don't cut the tenon off. I've lost count of the amount of times you've got carried away doing sets of doors or you know big batches of windows or something and you'll spin it around quick in the vise and go to cut the next one off and you've quickly cut the tenon off rather than cutting the haunch room. And it's pretty disastrous. Same thing with the middle rail, remember that we're using this bevel towards the top of the door 
so we don't want that the wrong way around. And sit the rail in. If there's any play in that, the width of that mortise, you want pushing down to this side because that's that side we've got no allowance for that uh, setback to cover anything. Whereas on the on the top edge here, there is an allowance to cover any gaps because we've got that setback in the rail. So we're gonna when we actually wedge this rail up. We're going to wedge it down in this direction so it goes nice and tight at that point there. So when we're setting these tenons, that's the point of reference. So we're just going to go inside of it there, in line with it there, and then this one's done. So it's just two marks on this one. And it's the same principle, leaving the square set as it was. Square them lines over and mark our haunt room. Out. So we're cutting haunch side of the line to leave the tenon to the thickness of the line. Down to that point there. We'll turn it in the vise so we're always cutting vertically. It helps you keep everything straight. And use a tenon saw to cut the other line. Well overdue a hand tool upgrade and it is coming soon, hopefully. And then we'll check each rail as we cut them to make sure they fit nicely in the door. That's the perfect fit for that size rail. I've got a feeling that's going to be a little bit tight on them bottom rails. That's beautiful. You can't quite see down there with the camera. The haunch looks nice and tight, and the shoulders are pretty flush. So there's a tiny bit of twist in that rail across there, so we'll have to keep an eye on that. But it doesn't twist the door, and I can check that this one is the same. It might be something to do with the rail. That joint's pretty nice, so we'll carry on. We know the depth of the haunch is good, and we can cut the others. If this joint won't go together with clamping force, so there's a gap here, we know that that haunch depth that we just cut is too long, so we just need to cut some more off that. And if we cut the end of the door off here to close to this finish width, but not all the way, we should be able to see exactly how much haunch depth we've got, whether it's too short or too long. We can make the adjustment after we've cut one and then cut the rest to suit, rather than cutting everything and go away watch rather than cutting everything and it all being wrong. It's the same concept with the middle rail. A fair few of these in the time. Me and the other apprentice used to race doing these. But if you set your coping saw at a bit of like a 45 degree, maybe just a bit over, you can always have a, a bit of a twist on the blade. It's, it's not doesn't make a great cut, but it helps you get it in one end, but start the cut the other in the 45 degree direction. But that gives you a chance of starting that cut. And then you can follow it along. This one wants to be below the line, but it's not too critical, because you're never going to see this cut. It's right in the middle of the door. She's coming a bit loose here. I've not done that for a while. You don't get to make many doors, but you want that cut to definitely not be above the line. So you, I would always cut it just slightly below it, maybe a blade width below, because any wobbles you get in it are just going to affect the joint going together. What feeling this is going to be a little bit tight. Get her in the vise. I said when I was setting up that the setting was probably 0.1 of a mil too tight for these big rails, and this is where it shows. See, it's really it will go together. It's it's a bit too tight to push together and pull apart quite easily. In my opinion, it's not too tight. It will go. We will be able to get it back apart. So we'll just clamp it together to check the joint. I think something's 
wrong with that? Suddenly got to there and gone very tight. Oh, there's a nib on the cutter there. I didn't push it all the way through the tenoner because it was hitting the other block. I'm going to have to do that. There we go. Thought that was a bit unusual. Come across that before. I hadn't pushed it right through the tenoner. Being distracted filming. So there we go. We're a lot better now. See that's the same sort of friction all the way through. And that joint pushes up nicely and is absolutely cock on for flush fitment. Give a little tap. Square them up. On these wider joints, you sometimes just have to check them with a clamp to make sure that they will pull up square. You want to clamp it away from the tenons. If you clamp in that tenon position and you've machined the tenon slightly long, you're just clamping against the rail itself and it won't affect the joint fit. That's gone up nice and tight with hardly any pressure. So we're all good on that one. The bottom rail is just a combination of the middle rail cut and the top rail cut. marked it out wrong you'll end up with a tenon there and then a tenon there and they'll be opposite hand. You can try that one in the door as well. Should just fall in nice. That's the perfect fit. Just when you're having to just just wrestle it as it seats that, that is a perfect fitting joint for a door because when you come to the other style, if it's any tighter, you're going to really struggle to get all three on at the same time. Here we go. Now while we've got the door dry assembled, I'm just going to make sure all these rails are seated up. So the insides of the mortises there, top and bottom, and the middle rail is seated down into the mortise that's exposed. I'm going to clamp that together, and that's how the door will look when it's finished. So now I've clamped it together, I can mark the braces out, I like to glue the braces in at the glue up stage with a domino in each direction to really hold them nice and securely. So this door is hinged off of this style here. So our braces want to extend from this style here at the bottom to the opening style at the top. If you want to do them in this configuration, if you've got a really wide door, you'd go from the bottom corner to the top corner. But I find a stronger setup is like this and you get two braces doing a nice 45 degree strength addition to the door. I've done a video on doing the braces, but I'll just run through it quickly again while we're doing this door. So you want to find the centre of the brace that you're going to be using, the piece of timber with a gauge. So you just go from both edges and then just to the middle of that. The two marks you should come up with a pretty much central position. And then just run that gauge on the back. So we want this is our visible face here. So we're going to run that gauge along the back down the ends past this point here so that we're going to be able to see the line once the brace has been cut. Both ends. I'm just going to run a pencil line in so that the camera can see it. And we just want to tick that centre line up over the ends of that piece of timber. One, two. And that's our reference point. Now if we use a straight edge, we can use this brace 
because it's going to be the right length for the job. Just bring it one way so the point is on that corner and cast the line from corner to corner through them points. So we've got a straight line that goes from corner to corner. We want to be working from the squared over line on the door style here, not the bevel line that we've put on this middle rail. And we can put that tick line referencing on the centre line that we've just marked at both ends. Once that's lined up on them two lines, so it's central into the corners, we just tick the undersides. I'm just going to mark the top on there because that's a square cut and at the bottom here one of these is a bevel. So the top side of this where everything's square we could just cut from this edge through with a square cutting saw or we can square these lines over and cut from the top side. It depends what type of saw you've got and what sort of finish it's going to do. I'm quite happy to cut from this side because I'm using a round over bit as well any sort of tiny breakout from a saw blade will be removed with the roundover bit. On the bottom edge here, this one, where it's away from the centre, is actually the position of this cut on the top of the piece of timber, so on the other side. So we need to square that over. I'm just going to do that there and use a bevel to get the same line. So make sure that's zeroed. 128.7 is our angle. So we go from this point here, 128.7. That's the position of that uh, top cut with a nine degree bevel cutting back on itself. So that's really important that we don't cut that square from the other side on that point or, or cut a bevel in the wrong plane so you've got to get your head around that and make sure you cut that right. So remember the line that you put on is the top side and if you transfer it to the top it's going to be right. So I'm going to set up the mitre saw for that cut there and do the bevel cut and then we can just come through it square from the other side and create that cut there. So we know we need a 38.7 millimeter bevel, so we can just put that straight into the saw, and then the bevel is away in this direction. So we've got a nine degree bevel on the rails, so I can now just shoot that line in on the saw, and everything should be fine. I just use the crosscut saw using the mitre cut as a reference for square and just pull that line through at a 90 degree. It's exactly the same cut for the top of the door except we're using a straight cut at 90 degrees rather than bevelled over at 9. The only difference being you're going to have to cut it in a different direction. So it's 38.7 uh, degrees just in the opposite hand. Remember we're leaving these lines just on so we're going slightly full of the line because the pencil line won't mark dead tight in that corner. And that should slip in there, just, just. You can use a razor sharp plane to make any very minor adjustments. Look at that, perfect. You just want to make sure that uh, the door is remaining square as you tap this in, which it shouldn't pull too far out of square if the joints are clamped across that wide rails. We just want to make sure that it is square, and we've got a slight taper on a joint like that, 
I've got a dead sharp plane and just take a couple of scrubs off the inside there to tighten that up. to get that together as a one -er. So what we have to do is domino these together when we're gluing up, so that the three rails are all joined together with a domino there and a domino at the other end. And then slot the two styles on. We'll never get these in by starting the rails and trying to domino and drop it in. So it just doesn't work. So there's a very set routine for gluing this up with a, a double domino like this. But once it is glued together, it makes for a very strong joint. Make sure you label these top and bottom if you've got two that are either identical or very near the same. So that when it comes to glue up stage, there's no panicking from a double second guess which one was the top, which one was the bottom, and then it not going together. Just quickly mark these domino positions. Now while the door's together, we can have a little gander at all of the wedges around the door. So what sort of size we're looking at being left with here that we need to accommodate with the wedge room. So we find the biggest one we can, we just work our way around and see what we've got. And then we can set up our little wedge jig on the bandsaw and cut our wedges so there's about two mil bigger than the biggest wedge at the widest point. And then we want to get that wedge down to about two to three mil at the narrow end to create a nice wedge shape to hammer into the door sides. You want to check all these with it together in case you've cut too much off one of the tenons or something like that or gone a bit wild with your wedge room on the mortiser, just to make sure that your wedges will fully cover that hole. You don't want to get to the glue up stage, especially with PU glue, and find that your wedges don't fit or are too slim to actually wedge the door up. I always use the offcuts when we were cutting that tenons and the haunches by hand in the vise there. Just keep your offcuts and they make the perfect wedges. So they're already the right length so that they won't butt in and hammer into the haunches so you can't make a wedge that's any longer than what's needed in the door and it's the right thickness too so if you ten and everything the right thickness it's going to fit in perfectly so i've got a few wedge profiles already set out on my little wedge jig it's nothing much to look at it's literally a, the offcut of the dirtiest bit of plywood i've ever seen so it's uh, not great it just shows you can use anything but these are just a slender wedge shape which generally about right. We'll find that wedge where we marked it out on. I've lost this one here. And we'll cut one through. And we'll see what sort of a wedge we end up with. Maybe a little bit more. What we're looking for is the butt end of the wedge to not be smaller than what the wedge room is in the door. It wants to be about two mil bigger, so that's the perfect wedge. So it gets to there just, just tight, and we can hammer that pretty much home all the way. It's got a bit more tension inside of the door, so that will tension up nicely. That one's perfect. Maybe a little bit thick, but it's fine. So there we go. I'm happy with that size wedge, so we'll cut all of them through. We're just left with the groove to put in now. So it's gonna be flush, the boarding's gonna be flush on this rail, so the groove's gotta go in the styles at that position. There we go, it's about seven and a half mil groove set at the height of the rails and the braces away from the face. So that gives us our board location where the boards will groove into the styles. We're going to run this groove around all the four parts of the door, so the style, the head, the top rail, sorry, and the other style. These rails don't need it because they're bare faced and they're uh, not going to need 
are grooving them because they sit behind the boarding. What we do need to bear in mind that on the two styles, when we're grooving them, we want to stop the groove within this rail here. We don't want to come out the top side of it. That's we're going to end up with a square hole poking out the top of the door, which is no good. So it's a stopped cut in this style and that style at the top rail. Right, it's glue up time. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna have much time to move the camera and stuff to get any good angles on this because I'm using PU glue and the weather like today, it goes off like the clappers. I'm gonna try and make things easy on myself. And glue the dominoes into one side of the domino joints and not get glue squeeze out on them. So that should help me get that part of it done to save a bit of time. But you want absolutely everything to be ready before you start blowing up with PU glue. So you don't want any problems because it's just gonna end in disaster. So the plan of attack for gluing this up is I've gotta get all my glue on my rails and the domino joint there where the brace is gonna go, lay it flat and then get the bottom brace glued as well, glued into it. So the domino will hold them together. Do that for the three rails so they're set and sort of glued together with the braces in between them. Glue the mortises on the styles, tap them in while it sits on the bench so that they're connected with the dominoes. I could do it vertically like this, but it's just a bit of a game holding these joints and connecting the two when you've got braces like this. So it's easier to have it all flat and just tap them in once it's all together. The glue will starting to foam and, and set a little bit by the time we get the two styles on. So we're gonna to have to clamp them up or clamp the joints tight together. So it's gonna be a bit of a game once you get to that point between getting the joints tight, getting the rails up against the stops and getting the braces in exactly the right place so that the door is nice and square. Like I say, you've not got a lot of time so I'm gonna be concentrating and not really talking through it. The aim is to get as much glue as possible all on the insides of the joints and just coat the rails with just enough so that it soaks in and then leaves the small residue on the surface. The more excess you get on the rails, the more glue squeeze out you get and the messier the glue up is. The joy of having the braces already cut for the door in the square position is we can set our clamps slightly biased so it pulls it tight against them braces. So we know that's the perfect square position so we can clamp it up with a view to working the embraces in nice and tight. So I'm going to make a start and have about 10 minutes of rushing around like a madman. Right, so a bit relaxed at the start, we'll just glue these in. Today is probably the, the worst day for a long glue up with PU glue, because it's got warm temperature and a fair bit of humidity as well. So. PU glue sets with that moisture content and the warmer it is, the quicker it sets too. So we're up against it a little bit. Let's get going. Start at the bottom. Let's go.
bottom rail. Pop a bit around there. Right, you want a bit of glue. I'll slip that in there, nice and ready. Oh, wrong way up. Wrong way up. Oh. Goes that way around. Come on. Work with yourself. There we go. Nice and ready. Metro. Too much glue on these bare face rails. It just pushes along and into the groove that we've made for the boarding. It becomes a bit of a pain in the ass. So we don't want too much, he says, as he's absolutely plastered that. If you look at a mass produced door when they're gluing them up, they only put a few dots out of an automated machine, literally a few blobs on the dowels, and then the door's pressed together, and that's it. That's all it is. So, really, it's probably a bit overkill gluing the door up like this with all this glue and the wedges and the tenons, but I've not seen one fail yet, and I've seen plenty of mass produced doors on their last legs and failing, so over engineering is the way forward sometimes. It's the middle rail, top side. You can sit in there, nice. gloves on when you're working with PU glue because it's uh, not so good for your skin. Middle of the door done. Let's start on the back of these. Is that going off? See it's starting going off already. A bit quick here. It's got a stick here that's um, half a mil thinner than the mortise and I've rounded the edges as long as the glue is in the joint it just hits the stick and spreads it itself so it's a dead quick way of spreading like a thick glue like for you get a shift on time oh yeah missed it there we go Come in. let's go left right Where's my stick? The dominoes. See that? It's nearly. It's not gone off. But you want to be putting it together now. So if you think you're going to be smaller than I am, then you want to be using something like a tight bond glue. Type bond 3 is a good one for the joinery. That. I'm just a bit of an idiot for not using it. Put the glam up on it and slowly pull it together. Look at that slipping in a tree. A little persuasion with a hammer. Just 
just keeps a bit of a pull. Tighten them braces up. These are just two 10 mil bolts and you can put two clamps together. So my longest clamps are about seven foot. I can do about 14 foot of clamping if I need to. Got it, that is nice. Everything's all tight so we can work it up now. It's uh, not very relaxing doing it with TV good. But it does allow you to carry on working on a single door like this. Have a cup of tea and you can clean it off. It's nice. Just pop a bit of glue in the wedges where it's not got loads in there. Normally you find most of it's foamed up and you can just pop the wedge straight in. You don't want too much glue in there else it creates like a fluid spring action and will pop the wedge back out if you're not careful. So just a touch, the pressure alone will hold it in. The glue just sticks it in place. And we'll hammer the wedges through. Wedges might actually be slightly too big. There's quite a lot of glue in there. So bottom rail, you're doing these two wedges first to wedge that rail tight against this stop, but not too much. So just enough to, to take the slack out, then you can wedge these two. You hear the change in the note of the timber as you're hitting it. It'll go from like a dull sound where the wedge is actually moving into the timber to that sort of sharp sound where it's not not moving anymore or it's moving very little. So once you hit that, just a couple more taps, you usually find, especially with the coir, once it's gone to that sharp sound, the wedge will just destroy itself if you keep on tapping it. You only need a gentle tap. The more door you've got behind that wedge, the harder you can hit it. On the middle rail, remember we've set it up with this bottom line here, so it's wedged down to that line. So in that case, we're wedging these two first to push it in that direction to take the slack out. It's not physically moving the rail, it's just taking the slack out of it. And then we just make that joint tight by hammering in the other side. You see there, there's too much glue in that, especially with PU glue when it started to set a little bit and it's got like that film, it will just bounce like that so you can keep tapping that until it gets rid of that glue. Here it's changed sound. That's your indication. Those wedges are very slightly too big, so they're not driving all the way home. You should technically wedge the corners first, so the top rail and the bottom rail, but this door's going nowhere. So you're taking the slack out, making sure it's up to that line, and then hammer them in equally to tighten the joint. And don't miss if you can help it. That's perfect. Just a little bit left before it goes tight. I know I've mentioned it before with PU glue. The best time to clean it off is when it's, I mean that's a bit runny still, but when it's set but not quite hard, so it's still, it doesn't stick to your tools, but it's soft enough to, to tool very easily. If it sets to the point where it's gone really hard, it can be, a, something like that can be quite difficult to remove because you, you're working against the hard, big lump of material. So you have to slice it off flush and then try and chisel it out the groove. Whereas if you can get to it, while it's still got a bit of plasticity to it, you can sort of get through the bulk of it by pushing it out of the way and just cutting the bit that's attached to the wood. But it's a, a bit 
bit early stages yet, that's still too runny to try and clean off that joint. We'll leave it a couple of minutes. Wish I could do this in fast motion. Gap on the hinge side, even with the closing side. They'll run it through the spindle to take the leading edge off. And what that gives us is a nice clearance on the edge of the door here, so the gap doesn't get tighter. It's actually, as the door opens, it clears more gap against the jam there. So if the if anything ever swells up, not that it will with a coil but more so in traditional timbers and French doors. If you've got a bevel where it opens like that, you'll always be able to get the door open and it's not going to wreck the door when you do push it open and it's gone tight by smashing this corner off here as it gets tight and catches. So I always put a four and a half degree bevel for a leading edge.
Right, so while the door's flat, I'm going to make the boarding. I'm just going to put a face mark on everything to designate which side I want to be the nice side of the door, so the outside. I'm just going to look the boards over, any sort of patches like that. Try and hide behind the rails in the door. You can actually get rid of quite a few imperfections if you swap the boards around. They can hide behind a rail or a brace. If you've got a, an edge or a bit like this, you can position it in the door so it will be hidden against a brace. One of these is slightly wider because it's got that extra tongue, which is that one. So I'm just going to write on that one, rebate. And then designate one of the other boards to be a rebate board too. So Let's have a look. See where we can get rid of that sat pocket. So I'm going to use that one. So if we use that one, have a rebate there. And then we just need to designate which side's got a tongue and which side's got a groove. So if we go through each board, find any imperfections, if there's an imperfection on the edge like this, we can use that as a tongue because we're going to machine 7mm of sight line away from that timber and it will be lost within the tongue and groove of the joint. So we want the cleanest edge on the groove side. So if we put that as a tongue, that is the groove. And that's the tongue, and that's the groove. Tongue, groove. And if you want to swap the orientation, we can turn the whole lot round. So you can make that a tongue, or this a tongue, on the outside boards. But we look pretty good as we are. So we'll have that as a groove, now that's a tongue. So now we can set up the machine. We can run the two rebates in on these outside boards and the tongues and grooves across all the rest of them. I usually do the rebates first on the outsides to slot in the groove because then you can't forget that you've got to do that and accidentally push them through and put a groove or a tongue on the edge of that board and then you've, you've wasted that board then because you can't remachine it for a rebate. If you're a bit unsure of your measurements, you can check, push them all up tight one board out and check what you've got left against the thickness of that board and then work out how many gaps and what lengths of tongues you've got to machine off each board and you should work out whether you're going to end up right or not.